Okay guys, so one of the comics, if you guys have been following my reviews, is Wayward, which I'm pretty obsessed with. It's pretty colored and it's Asian y and everything <laughs> all this stuff. So I have here the wonderful Jim Soap. Hello. The writer of Wayward. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself for those who don't know? Sure. Uh, I'm Canadian, but don't hold it against me. It's Sunday here at Comic Con, <laughs> so we're extra punchy. Like this manic look in our eyes, that's all natural. We didn't. And we're it's, in the white room. And we're in the white, we're in this strange, bleak, white re meeting room. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, we're very serious. This is a very serious interview. Serious comic uh, So, I'll start again. Uh, so, I'm Jim Zub, I'm a Canadian uh, and a comic writer. And we, uh, I'm making comics, and um, I'm known for all sorts of different commercial stuff like Dungeons and Dragons and Conan and Samurai Jack. I'm writing the Thunderbolts right now for Marvel and I wrote the Figment book for Disney uh, and on the creator on front I did a book called uh, Skull Kickers in 2010 and that kind of got me my big push forward uh, and now I'm doing Wayward and a brand new title launching in September called Glitter Bomb and other than that nothing S sitting in white rooms <laughs> <than> nothing, nothing. <laughs> other than that stuff nothing just bored this is actually really like a mind suck I yeah, just feel like it's a little strange they take all the artists the creators put in here and they just yeah. it's it very colorful right? just off camera you don't even know one of the things I loved about Wayward was, um, one, it's set in Japan, right. which I believe is like ripe for like supernatural crazy. Absolutely. Um, and what I also love, just kind of skipping ahead a little bit, um, the back of Wayward actually right. is all that history. Right, right. With, uh, with the monsters and everything. So like, how much fun and distracting was the research? How so did it keep you from that? The, to explain to anyone watching this, I mean, if you're watching the reviews, you already know, but the quick version. So Wayward is sort of like Buffy in Japan, teenagers fighting Japanese mythological monsters. Uh, it's bloody and it's dramatic and it's uh, teenage drama and it's great. It's a lot of fun. I'm biased, but it is. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's bloody. It's, it's great. It's great. It's good for you. <laughs> But yeah, the uh, and it's built off of this bedrock of yokai stories. So the the stories of ghosts and spirits and monsters in Japan. So in the same way that Europe has a very rich, you know, kind of mythological history with unicorns and dragons, uh, things like that, uh, vampires, werewolves, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Japan has their own kind of mythological creatures and has their own sort of spiritual stories that exemplify thematic things about their culture. And so digging into those and researching them and then bringing them into the modern world is really kind of what the story is all about. And that was a ton of fun because you, I, I was a big fan of yokai stories before we did Wayward, but you know, the deeper you go, the more you realize there are hundreds and hundreds of legends and that like all other sort of fables and fairy tales, they've grown and changed a lot over the years and so really um, they just yeah it could be difficult to sort of pare it down and go what are we going to use or what is the best fit but there's such a huge tapestry to draw upon that we're able to just no matter what kind of story we want to tell there are multiple creatures that we can sort of bring into play it's tons of fun it's awesome and then having someone like Steven as a like a, a co-creator uh, envisioning them and just taking it to the next level, it's the best. Has anybody ever came up to you and be like, that's not exactly how I learned a yokai, but I loved right. your version or hated your version? Like, did anybody ever like well, call you up on it? So here's the thing, right? So like a lot of other fables, okay, so you look at vampires in Euro sort of centric uh, mythology. You know, there are versions of vampires that are cute and there are versions of vampires that are romantic and there are versions of vampires that are bloodthirsty, mindless monsters, mm -hmm. right? And everything in between. And the same holds true of a lot of yokai, mm -hmm. right? So something like Kappa, there are these uh, turtle creatures called Kappa, and they've been reinvented hundreds of times in media. Everything from cute, unbelievably ridiculously cute uh, little creatures, Pokemon and things like that, all the way up to, you know, the original sort of stories, which are like bloodthirsty, savage monsters that kill people when they're taking a dump in the pond. That's the original mythological story. They literally will attack your butt and tear you in half and stuff. And so... It's not a, like, don't go to the bathroom story. It's like, don't go to the bathroom story, yeah. So, um... When you look at that broad of a range, I feel like we could plant our flag almost anywhere within there and have a a reasonable interpretation, you know, and that's true of a lot of these creatures. So I'm sure you could say, hey, well, the it the story can be different, or these sources, you know, say different things. Mm -hmm. We try and just pull a through line through each of them and say, okay, this is what we feel is most important about that creature, or this is what that myth sort of thematically does for our story, mm -hmm. and it seems to work okay. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, 
I'm I'm a scared cat. I'm a huge scared right. cat. So some of those monsters are actually really cool, and some of them are scary, like the spiders. Right. Which is actually one of the reasons why I got it, because it's in her ear. I'll go. I'll. Mm. <laughs> because you know up to a certain point i was like oh they're like the good guys they're gonna make good decisions right and then they don't have you met teenagers they don't make good decisions i guess maybe i, I didn't was make, like the goody two shoes i guess i, I don't know i didn't make good decisions as a teenager i don't feel like that <laughs> i guess i was very sheltered i've been a lot of babysitters clubs so i have like this very happy bubble <laughs> so when i read what they were doing i'm like right. where are your parents Oh my right. God! How are you? That's there's like, some no. really there's some really bad decisions in Wayward, Very. and I think that that's kind of fun too because it, you know when you're at that vulnerable age where you're not a kid anymore and you're not an adult and you have those kinds of hard decisions to make, you're under so much pressure. And then we amp that up with a supernatural component and with the kinds of difficulties and decisions they have to make in the heat of the moment. Yeah. That's when you see what they're capable of, and it's not all good. No. And really. It's one of my favorite aspects of writing Wayward is that we set up a bunch of assumptions in the first story arc that the monsters are bad and the kids mm -hmm. are good. Mm -hmm. And slowly over time, we kind of disassemble that and say, it's complicated. Yeah. It's complicated. I think one of my one of my favorite reviews um, that people were laughing about with me was um, it got to a certain issue where I was like, okay, so we got a bunch of teenagers, right. no mentor, and they're crazy and they give zero fucks now. Yep. All shit just broke loose. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. <laughs> they don't have the kind of mentorship or, or, or guidance in order to understand the ramifications. The reader gets a sense of the broader sort of mm -hmm. ripples that they keep creating, mm -hmm. but the in, the kids don't. They yeah. don't. They don't know. So dangerous. That every decision wow. they make is is bleeding outward and doing all sorts of terrible things. Which I think is amazing because you right. see so many teenager stories where it's like there's a mentor or right. like they have someone. Someone's going to be no. like, oh, you've gone too far, and yeah. these guys are just. Nope, we nope. just keep going. Just keep going, and uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's nasty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what can uh, we look forward to for Wayward? Now? So spoilers at the end of uh, issue 15, the group splits. So they they're in two different locations. I don't want to say anything much beyond that. Um, so we're going to be toggling between those two locations mm -hmm. in the new upcoming issues. So one group has been pulled somewhere else, and they've got to deal with the ramifications of that. And the group that got left behind and mm. kind of abandoned mm. has to then sort of so deal with. Split again. Yeah, so wow. it's it's but it's a, a different mix and a different mess, mm. and so uh, a lot of stuff's going to come to roost, okay. uh, and some things that we've been building towards but um, haven't. Yeah, we've been seeding clues for a couple of different things that we're really looking forward to showing people. There's going to be some really awful stuff coming in the upcoming mm. arc. Um, oh, it's gonna make so much fun. The, the, so the fun. drama, yeah, the drama is <laughs> intense on this one, and uh, I think the other thing we've been doing over the last few issues, in particular, is sort of peeling things back and giving you a sense of the scope, mm -hmm. how big it can get, mm -hmm. and that's going to continue as well. And so, some stuff that people thought was they may have been curious about, or little bits and pieces we hinted about in the first arc, is now going to kind of pull back the curtain a bit more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Going from crazy teenagers right. to probably screwed up Hollywood. To crazy Hollywood. Tell us a little bit about Glitter Bomb. I, okay. I keep wanting to go Glitter Bomb. Glitter Bomb. <laughs> That's good. Comes with a little hand wave every time I talk. It's a Glitter Bomb. So Glitter Bomb is um, it's a Hollywood horror story that comes out September 7th. Um, and it's something that I've been digging into for a while. More research, more intensity. The quick pitch is it's about a middle-aged actress who can't get roles anymore because she's not the young pretty thing anymore, but she's not old enough to play someone's grandma, and Hollywood ha has no place for middle-aged actresses for some ludicrous reason, and her own sort of fears and frustrations uh, around fame and around failure kind of manifest themselves a bit like demonic possession, and so she goes on a bit of a revenge track, and uh, that morally compromised kind of thing we see in Wayward, mm -hmm. Is she right? Is she wrong? The answer is probably yes and no. And so lots of uh, dark, black-hearted analysis of our obsession with famous people, our mm -hmm. obsession with celebrity, 24-hour <laughs> entertainment news, mm -hmm. and the lengths that we'll go to to try and you know please that inner void of of you know self-gratification mm -hmm. or having people validate our own ideas and we see that on social media very, you know very. if people like something literally or controversy as long as you're getting 
eyeballs yeah, and attention, that and then that is it, yeah. then that is counted as validity. Mm -hmm. And and pushing that to an extreme and lashing back at it, you know, these are really intense emotions. Whether it's people's own fears or their ideas about dignity and how they're yeah. treated by others, or you know that sense of self failure or you know empowerment. These are things that Hollywood stories tug on those strings so hard mm -hmm. and when you play with that kind of stuff and you mistreat it you know it's gonna lash back yeah so was there like an incident or story that inspired you to write glitter bomb i mean hollywood's right right full of crazy but. so obviously i'm not a famous hollywood person but um i've gone through sort of you know depressive moments of my life or periods where that kind of fear of what am i doing with my life what is my ability and how far can I take this those those answers you don't have about the future of your career or the future of your ideas or, or your future in general have really um, had had driven pretty deep mm -hmm. into me and I thought you know everyone tells stories about the the character of destiny the one in a million yeah. the person who defeats the odds and does some incredible thing no matter what's like, all set up for this person but everyone else has a story too yeah. and the people that fail and the people that don't get what they want those emotions are actually in some ways more resonant to real life and to us because you you don't get what you want because you don't have easy answers because there is no happy ending and a roll the credits mm -hmm. and so exploring that I felt like was really fertile ground mm -hmm. and was a way for me to kind of like dig into myself and go I am terrified of not being loved I'm terrified mm -hmm. of not not being successful I'm mm -hmm. terrified of people not acknowledging me mm -hmm. and kind of channel that intensity on the page and then the idea of Hollywood has that on such a exposed level mm -hmm. that idea of uh, fame or you're big you're hot or you're not mm -hmm. you know you're you're in the news for all the right reasons or all the wrong mm -hmm. reasons the, the the extreme poverty versus rich or visibility versus obscurity that just felt like the perfect place to set it mm -hmm. because you have that intense extreme. And the more I read about Hollywood stuff, particularly that idea of these actresses who are perfectly skilled, perfectly capable, mm -hmm. but there's just a blind spot. They'd rather have a co-star, a female co-star be, you know, 20 years younger than the male lead than actually cast someone that's age appropriate. Yeah, because it's an ageism thing going It's a total on. It's so ageism horrible. thing. And I thought that is, such a clear representation of being forgotten, mm -hmm. of being left behind, of being obscured. Mm -hmm. And that would drive me nuts. Mm -hmm. And what if we took that to the next level? What if we took that to a brutal, nasty, kind of <laughs> demonic level of I'm gonna get you, you know? Now yeah. even though you had the main character as an actress, right. you still think that's something that like a layman like me can still relate to. Well, and that's what I mean. I think everyone has had those moments in their life where they feel like they don't know what they're doing with mm -hmm. themselves, or they wish they made different decisions, or they want to blame other people for their problems mm -hmm. and everything in between. Mm -hmm. And so I think Farrah's story is quite a universal one mm -hmm. where we've all had that rage or we've all wanted to just reach out and grab someone and sort of put your blame on a system or put your blame on society or or just erupt mm -hmm. with your own emotional sort of intensity about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is kind of a universal story about, about us as people and the kinds of things that we want or don't get. Hmm. Yeah. And then as you're writing this, and you probably, it's probably you know, you're still writing this or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> How has it changed you? How has it like changed your thoughts? Did it like help almost you every project that I do, and everyone does, they do it because it. Ideally, you're doing it because it means something to you, mm -hmm. or because you're you're saying something. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of times, when I see a pitch from a new writer, and I made this mistake early on as well. There's nothing beating under it. it it's all plot. They'll say, "Well, it's a dog fighting a vampire." Or it's a you know. They'll just tell you plot. They'll tell you objects. They'll tell you a place. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what's it actually about? Or they'll say something really pithy like, well, it's good versus evil. You're like, well, that is a theme, but it's not a very interesting theme. Right. Or it doesn't have much complexity to it. There's or, no substance to it. It's right. just like black and white, yeah. And so almost everything I work on, you know, thematically has something that I'm interested in talking about. And the way you test that idea is by putting it in jeopardy. You know, the way you explore that thing is by 
trying to prove it in some regard without being unbearably preachy, without being too obvious, mm -hmm. ideally, you know what I mean? And so Glitter Bomb's another example of that where I, I sort of looked at this thing and I go, I am totally afraid. Uh, when I go into a pitch meeting or when I'm meeting with my peers, I want them to like me, I want mm -hmm. to be successful, I want to have validation for my storytelling. Mm -hmm. Why does that scare me so much? And what can I say about that you know, vulnerability mm -hmm. that feels real? Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that's pretty intense because you have yeah. so many works underneath your belt and, and right. I consider you pretty darn successful <laughs> as it is. And it's weird because I, I go through periods where I do mm -hmm. and I go through periods where I don't, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, they're all me, mm -hmm. but it just where you're riding on mm -hmm. that sort of roller coaster at, at any particular time, mm -hmm. you know, and so there's there's times where I, I pinch myself and I go, wow, look at all this amazing stuff I've had the opportunity to contribute to. Mm -hmm. And then there's other times where I'm like, whether it's looking at my peers or seeing someone very young mm -hmm. who's kicking ass in the industry mm -hmm. and I'm like, man, they've got 10 years on me. Like they're, they're, almost, they're doing almost as much stuff as I am, but they've got so much longer to build and all those comparative kind of fears. And um, kind of speaking of which, how are those gonna be? How like, are they gonna work? Yeah. So I mean, we got um, the wayward monsters. Right. I mean, how is this gonna be? So Jabril Morissette is the artist. He's my co-creator. He's unbelievably skilled. He's very young. Mm -hmm. So uh, he just turned 22 last week. And when you look at those pages, you can't and believe. And he gets to work with you. That's such a well, cool. Well, I feel I feel really fortunate to work with him because I know he's gonna be a superstar. He is doing unbelievably professional work. He's on time, which I know didn't sound like a big deal, but in, in this industry, that <laughs> is like, time, you have you no time. idea how valuable <laughs> that is. And good, like really good <laughs> and fast, like come on. Um, and and the quality of the storytelling he's putting on the page mm -hmm. and the nuance to the emotions, mm -hmm. it's really paying this stuff off in a way that, you know, I'd always hoped it would. Mm -hmm. And the creature design stuff, I try to leave it open enough that he's able to design and come up with something really cool to show. And I'm not telling him exactly how it has to look. Okay. But on the other hand, a, a script is like part story and it's like part private letter to the artist cheerleading them on. <laughs> and so trying to give him a sense of mood or give him a sense of texture and place mm -hmm. that he can impart in the artwork. Mm -hmm. And when he brings back the artwork and, it, and it's all working, I'm like, okay, you're in the right frame of mind or what I was hoping you would be, you know? And I think that's one of the coolest things about having that collaborative process with someone else. Um, yeah, Jabril's amazing. And, and so sometimes I'll say, okay, I, I have this idea for the way this will burst, the way this will explode, the way we're gonna tear into this sometimes quite literally uh you know take this and run with it mm -hmm. and he's been really good about sort of mm. trying to push himself artistically and do some really nasty terrible things how did you guys start this collaboration together did you find um, him he found you the company found uh, you guys? i lucked out i was at montreal comic-con last year mm -hmm. uh there's an artist named marguerite savage mm -hmm. who lives in montreal and she's a dear friend she had done an alt cover for wayward and I was just at the show. Show was actually hadn't even started yet. We were just setting up, mm -hmm. and she came over to my table and, and said, "I have to introduce you to my friend, this young artist who had just graduated from art school." And uh, she wanted me to give him a portfolio critique. Mm -hmm. When I'm not writing comics, I teach at an art college, so my background's in art, which has uh, been very valuable while working with artists. Mm -hmm. So I go over and I look at his stuff, and I was honestly blown away. Like it, the quality was so beyond what I expected from someone from his age that I, I had a moment where I didn't believe he'd done it. Like I was just like, did you ink over someone else's pencils? Which is, you know, <laughs> inking is a valid vocation in this field. And he was like, no, no, this is all mine. And then I got it in my head, okay, he must have spent like a week per page or some ludicrous, because that's what happens when you're early in your career. First you get good and then you get fast. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, I do a page a day. And I was just like, please don't, <laughs> wow. don't lie. <laughs> you know, it's okay if it takes you longer, you're just getting started. But he was very insistent that he could do it on time. And I said, okay, here's my portfolio critique. We should do a book. Wow. And uh, it was as simple as that. I just, I knew I wanted to work with this guy. And the response I've got when I show his artwork to other mm -hmm. artists or creators, they just respond viscerally because they can see there's something really special there. And so I feel very, like I said, very fortunate to have found someone so great. And we put together the pitch. I took it to New York Comic Con last year, 
and uh, pitched it to Eric Stevenson from Image. Oh, really? And on the spot, he gave us the green light. Wow. So what's amazing about comics, in any other medium, that would mean, okay, years from now, we'll mm -hmm. see this thing come out. Less than a year later, I mean, New York Comic Con's in October, uh, so September, so less than a year after I pitched it, it's in print and it's coming out. That's just really fast. It is. Wow. It is. Uh, we're stoked. We can't wait for people to dig in and see I, this all I'm come together. I'm definitely really excited for Glitter Oh, thank Bob. you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. From what I loved about Wayward, and I'm actually kind of native to Hollywood, so I'm probably going to agree with a lot of these manifestations. Nice. <laughs> um, and then one last thing, since you also mentioned that you were, uh, you are a teacher. Yeah. Um, what would be like your advice for anybody who's new and upcoming? Trying to make their own mm -hmm. stories. So writer or artist I think it's really important to make the kinds of comics or draw the kind of style that you are most gravitate towards because some people they get it in their head they have to figure out what the market wants yeah. and they try and put themselves into twist themselves into a pretzel to be something they're not mm -hmm. and what we've seen time and time again is that creators who are passionate about their work and deliver quality can carve out a market for themselves. If you look at some of the biggest independent success stories of the last 10 years, they are not comics that there was anything like them out there. Mm -hmm. Whether it's Bone or The Walking Dead or Scott Pilgrim mm -hmm. or Mouse Guard, these are comics that no one else was doing stuff like it. And you can imagine them going into a pitch meeting and someone being like, oh, I don't, I don't know that anyone would want this. Mm -hmm. Like that's why you should do it. That's why it's different. That's mm -hmm. why it's unique and interesting. So rather than trying to be like, well, what's really hot right now is, yeah. you know, zombies and Pokemon. So we'll do zombie, <laughs> poke zombie or whatever. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. But regardless, you know, um, rather than trying to trend hop and try and be something you're not, tell a story that means something to you. And if you can tap into something real you know, readers will respond. Cool. Yeah. This is the last day of Santa Comic Con, yeah. so we are both a little bit punchy. But um, four days later, five days, whatever late days yeah. it is. Infinite number of infinite days. Number of this days. convention never ends. <laughs> they lock us in here until next year. We just, they just put us in stasis. It's terrifying. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even here. I'm like, <laughs> you know. Um, you probably met a lot of people, yes. and I, my favorite thing about convention, it's like a source of inspiration and creativity, or just to rejuvenate yourself. Have you had any of that here, or like any fans are like, oh man, you really spurred me on, like yeah. any cool experiences? I love conventions, I love meeting uh, peers and talking to them about the craft, or complaining about things we don't like, <laughs> or just being ridiculous, but and I love meeting readers who are you know passionate about the books. I mean, it changes you, because you know, I love getting tweets or I love getting messages from people, but meeting someone in person and having that moment where you're interacting with them, it becomes real. Like, oh, you're not just text coming through on my phone. You're a real human being and this uh, affected you and you enjoyed it or you're buying this for a friend or all those sorts of things. You can't really um, get any other experience like that. And that's why I love conventions. So there's been a ton of them. There's been some really, really cool moments. I had a, a crazy thing where Robbie, uh, the guy who writes Silk for um, uh, over at Marvel, mm -hmm. he um, he worked on he, wor he writes on Supernatural and all sorts of things like that. And he was talking about my blog, and he said, "Oh, I really like your articles, and I love reading them, and it helped me, you know, write comics." And I was just like, "What? <laughs> like, no, no, you don't understand. You're the big deal, and I'm the guy just getting going." That just, you've upended all my my thought process. So wow. that kind of stuff, getting validation from a peer, that's mm -hmm. pretty mind blowing. You know, where someone is like, or I'm in a mixed company of people, and and they're like, oh, who are you? And you introduce yourself around, and you can see it when someone introduces themselves, and we already know who they are. We're like, oh, we love your work, and they're just like, what? <laughs> you like me? You know, it's like that it's little like, dorky oh. sort of thing. Yeah, it's very cool. So like, no matter what, it's, just, it's always a nice feeling. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, conventions can be wear you down. Yeah. And you have to be careful not to extend yourself too much, mm -hmm. but uh, it can be really cool to sort of step out of the cave where you've been working, <laughs> you know, and be into the sunlight and go, oh, there are human beings. See the faces. I should interact with them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. Absolute pleasure. And talking to us. To so. Hello there, Fangirl Nation. Um, <laughs> if we're allowed to leave San Diego Comic-Con, <laughs> then uh, you'll see us again soon. All right. Take care. <laughs>